everyone. You know, every once in a while, a story comes along that captivates the country. The story of college linebacker Manti Teo and his fictitious girlfriend has become a national obsession and has been called one of the strangest sports stories in recent memory. Perhaps because it's got all the makings of a page turner or made for TV movie. Football, fame, technology, and deceit and so many unanswered questions. Today, Manti speaks in his first television interview since the scandal broke. But we begin with a look back at the twists and turns of this bizarre story. Here's Matt Gutman. Ferocious on the field, Manti Teo is a Notre Dame golden boy. Restoring glory to a lagging football legacy. The linebacker lifting the blue and gold to their first undefeated season in decades. He grew up in Hawaii, nourished on his Mormon faith and football. But in his senior season, his story was shaped not only by his play, but also by a dramatic turn in his personal life. Teo told teammates and his parents he'd been dating a Southern California beauty named Lene Kakua. They had met online in 2009. Then, in April 2012, she was in a near-fatal car crash that left her in a coma. And in June, while still in the hospital recovering, she was diagnosed with leukemia. They were so close, according to Teo, they'd fall asleep every night to the sound of the other breathing. She is just that person that I turn to. The love of my life. But then, on September 12th, just hours after he was told his grandmother had passed, he learned Lene had also died. Last thing she said to me was, I love you. It was a romance and a tragic twist that made for great copy. And the stories in print and on TV piled up about Mante Teo's heavy heart as he led his team to victory after victory. His fame grew, and on December 8th, he was voted runner-up for the Heisman Trophy, nearly unprecedented for a defensive player. But two days before that ceremony, and three months after Lene Kakua had died, Teo received a phone call. He told the ESPN's Jeremy Schapp about that call in an audio interview last week. He said, it's Lene. And so we carried on that conversation, and I just got mad, and I just went on a rampage. Like, how could you do this to me? Like, I ended that conversation by saying simply this. You know what? Lene, my Lene died on September 12th. But in fact, Lene didn't die because it would turn out she never existed. The sports website, deadspin.com, broke the story. We got an email uh, last week that said there's something fishy about Lene Kakua, Manti Teo's alleged girlfriend. You guys should check it out. On January 16th, the same day that Deadspin report was published, Teo says he got a call from his prankster confessing everything. It was only then that Teo admitted to his friends and the media he'd actually never met Lene Kakua. But those pictures were real, belonging to a real Diana O'Meara, who Inside Edition captured on video for the first time. She's a 22-year-old who went to high school with the prankster. She denies any involvement. Teo claimed to be a victim of catfishing, which has become the phrase associated with someone being tricked into a romantic relationship through an online encounter after the movie of the same name. According to Teo, the man behind the hoax, Renaya Tuisisopo. Hey, what's up, everyone? Um, this is Renaya. His victims say the 22-year-old Christian crooner created the personality of the lovely Lene Kakua and engaged Teo in an intense phone and online relationship with a woman who didn't exist. Some remain skeptical, thinking Teo must have played a part in creating the drama. But while he now admits he embellished this story in interviews and to his parents, he denies he took part in the scam. Were you in any way part of this? No. Never. Never? Ever. Would I be part of this? Still, so many questions remain. Manti Teo, thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. So, sitting next to you as that piece ran, I couldn't help but wonder what was going through your head. Some good times and some bad times. I just 
Good memories and bad memories. What have the last few weeks been like for you? I think for me, it's it's been hard. It's been difficult. Uh, just you know, not only for myself, but you know, to see your last name and just to see it plastered everywhere, and to know that you know I represent so many people and that my family is experiencing the same thing. I think that's what was the most hard for me. The big question everyone is asking is, did you somehow help concoct this hoax, or are you, in fact, an innocent victim? We're going to be talking about that when we come back. Still to come. One of the theories is you created this whole scenario to cover up your sexual orientation. Are you gay? And what Manti told his father. Why did you lie to him? At some point, did you just be Notre Dame football star Manti Teo, who says he is the victim of a hoax involving a made-up young woman named Lene Kakua. Manti, did you have any involvement in creating the scam? No, I, I, I did not. I think what um, people don't realize is that the same day that everybody else found out about this situation, I found out. See. I got the call on December 6th uh, saying that she was alive. And from December 6th to January 16th, my whole reality was that she was, a, uh, she was dead and all of a sudden she's alive. At that time, I didn't know that it was just somebody's prank. I know that you say uh, Renaya Tuyoso Sopo confessed to perpetrating this scam in a direct message to you on Twitter on January 16th. An excerpt of those messages reads as follows. It's the 16th. I wanted to tell you everything today. I will not say anything to anyone else before I tell you everything. I would and will never say anything bad about you or your family. I completely accept the consequences to the pain I've caused, and it's important that you know the entire truth before anyone else. You say he later called you. What did he say to you on the phone? He just basically ex expressed you know, and, and just explained where, what he did and why he did it. And did he say why he did it? He didn't say why. He, he just explained that he, he just wanted to help people, and that was his way of helping people, of... You know, being someone that he wasn't and trying to, to trying to connect with somebody on a different level to, to help him out. And what did you say to him? Well, obviously, it didn't really help me out, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I didn't really say anything. You know, I was still speechless. I just found that everything that and I believed to be my reality wasn't actually reality at all. It was reported in Deadspin that you and Renaya were family. Someone's called you family, or at least family friends. Mm -hmm. Were you? No, I've previously, previous to that conversation that he, he and I had on January 16th, I had only talked to Renaya uh, twice. Uh, he, from my understanding, was Lene's cousin and was Lene's favorite cousin. And the only time I would talk to uh, Renaya uh, was when I couldn't find Lene. The Sports Illustrated reporter who wrote your cover story has made some of the transcript of your interview available. He asked you, quote, how did you meet her? And you responded, we met just, she knew my cousin. Later you told him you met at a USC game your sophomore year, that you were just friends then. Can you see why people would view this as, at worst, as a complete lie and at best, as incredibly misleading? Mm -hmm. I, I can see that, and for that, you know, for people feeling that they're misled, you know, that I'm sorry for. But I wasn't as forthcoming about it, um, but I didn't lie. You know, I never was asked, um, did you see her in person? And so through the embarrassment and, you know, the fear of what people may think that I was committed to this person who I didn't have the chance to meet and she all of a sudden died, now that, that scared me. And so to avoid um, any further conversation, I kind of, you know, wasn't as forthcoming as I should have been. Aren't you splitting hairs a little bit here, Manti? Yeah. Didn't you actually say things that weren't true? And isn't that, in essence, lying? I think the biggest lie that I'm 
sorry for is the lie that I told my dad. Uh, when I told dad, when he asked me, hey, did, you know, did you see her? And I said, no. I mean, yes, I saw her. And, you know, as a child, your biggest thing is to always get the approval of your parents. And for me, I was so invested in, you know, Lene and getting to know her that, you know, when dad asked me, hey, did you meet her? I said, yeah. We'll talk to your dad about that later. But you have said you didn't want people to think you were a weirdo mm -hmm. by admitting that you had never in fact met this young woman but didn't you have something to gain Manti by keeping this story alive didn't it make you into this incredibly sympathetic figure you led your team to an undefeated season you were being praised national championship game was this intoxicating in a way for you Manti I think for me the only thing I basked in is that no I could I had an impact on people, that people turned to me and for inspiration. And I think that was the only thing I focused on. You know, my story, I felt, was a guy who, in times of hardship and in times of, of trial, uh, really, you know, held strong to his faith, held strong to his family. And I felt that that was my story. Even if that hardship was perhaps exaggerated? No, it was, what I went through was real. You know, the feelings, the, the pain, the sorrow, that, that was all real. And that's something that I, I can't fake. Do you think this storyline helped propel you to second place in the Heisman voting? I don't know. No, I, I really don't know. Did your friends or your family know that you were involved in a relationship with someone you had never, ever met? in person yes some of my friends knew and thing is you know there are countless times where I, we try to meet up and things just never never worked out we'll talk about that your efforts to meet her and we'll also later hear the voice of the person claiming to be Lene Kakua Coming up, you get a call from someone saying she'd been in a terrible accident. An elaborate story spirals out of control. It goes on and on and on. I this that. web of lies. And so you said, oh no, now you have to worry of Manti Teo. And Manti, no, you started uh, communicating with Lene Kakua off and on during your freshman year. She reached out to you on Facebook and you were concerned enough to ask some of your friends about her. Uh, to your friend Lyle, you wrote, I was just wondering because it does seem kind of weird. And so I was like wondering if it was someone else pulling a prank or something you're talking about, Lene. And he responded, oh yeah, she's not a fake person. She's a real person. But she just kind of fake when it comes to other things. So s something in your interaction with this person must have made you suspicious, must have seemed, seemed kind of sketchy. Mm -hmm. What was it? Why were you sort of doubting her existence or whether she was real well everybody has to realize is our relationship wasn't a four-year relationship I, I knew her I knew of her um, and we'd speak as friends you know ever since my freshman year and she had boyfriends and you know she I had you know girls who I knew and you know, it was it was pretty it was a friend friend relationship um, but it didn't start to pick up until my junior year and uh, it was just, since I didn't meet her and I didn't see her in person and she just seemed nice and from the pictures she seemed, you know, very beautiful and I needed to find somebody who knew her and supposedly met her and asked them, you know, hey, is this person real? In fact, you reached out to a number of people who confirmed basically, yeah, she's a real person, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and so that was my way of saying, okay, she's real, they met her, they've seen her, so this girl was in the pictures and this girl who I'm talking to must be the same. You attempted a few times to talk with her uh, through FaceTime and you would see basically what a, a black box and she right. would say to you I can see you yeah I don't know why you can't see me. Correct. Did you think that was a little weird? To be honest, no. <laughs> no? I didn't. Are you that technologically challenged? I am, but yeah. someone your age shouldn't be, right? Yeah, I saw a black screen, and yeah, she said, I can see see you, and I can see me. You should be able to see me. I was like, 
I don't know what's wrong with your camera, but I can't see you. I, know, I wasn't, I wasn't paying attention, I guess. I'm sure you're a BMOC, big man on campus. You're reportedly very well liked, very popular. I hope so. You go to Notre Dame. I'm imagining there are a lot of nice young women who go to school there. Why wouldn't you want a real girlfriend who you could actually spend real time with in person? Yeah. Well, this Lene person, there are so many similarities. She was Polynesian, supposedly. She is Samoan. I'm Samoan. She loved her faith and she knew a lot about, you know, I'm, I'm Mormon, and she knew a lot about that. I found a lot of, you know, peace and a lot of comfort in being able to talk to somebody, and they knew my standards, they knew my culture, they knew what is expected of me, and I knew what's expected of her. One of the theories, many theories, Manti making the rounds, is somehow you created this whole scenario to cover up your sexual orientation. Are you gay? No, far from it, far from that. <laughs> As you mentioned, you did try to see her in person on multiple occasions, mm -hmm. and she would always come up with an excuse as to why she couldn't meet you. Mm -hmm. I mean, as this happened repeatedly, didn't you think there is something really fishy going on here? For me, I guess I was just so caught up in the whole thing that I was like, okay, she can't see me. And she would give me good reasons, too. She would say, oh, my brother's out of my car. Or, you know, I'm in the hospital. Or, you know, I wasn't going to tell a person who just came out of a coma, like, oh, you need to call and come and see me right now. You know? We'll get into the accident in a moment. But over the Christmas holidays a year ago, mm -hmm. you did lie to your father. Mm -hmm. She was in Hawaii, uh, where you were, where you, your family lives. And you made plans to see her. Yes. I asked my dad if I could go sleep over one of my friend's houses. And while I'm sleeping over, I made plans to say, okay, dad, I'm going to go and try and meet, meet up with her. That night was the, when I brought up, oh, my, my brothers are using my car. And you know, since he's not from Hawaii, I knew she didn't have multiple cars and they only had one car, the rental car. And when she said, you know, they have it, and I'm over at the hotel and... I can't go anywhere. Can you come over here? And it's one of those things where it didn't happen. And so when I got home, Dad just asked me, how was it? And I just said, it was good. He was like, did you, did you meet her? I said, yeah. Why did you lie to him? That's something that, like I said before, is the thing I, I regret the most. And as my way of trying to get my dad's approval, um, of this young lady because um, I knew that if he knew that I didn't meet her it would immediately he would just say no red flag obviously a red flag that I obviously should have seen but I didn't telling him that um, you allowed him to perpetuate the lie mm -hmm. because it was reported that you had gotten together with her in Hawaii and your dad subsequently mm -hmm. told reporters that mm -hmm. Yeah. At yeah. some point, did you just feel like I'm I'm in this too deep? I can't extricate myself from this whole web. Yeah, I, f I felt overwhelmed a lot um, by this whole circus of events. Still to come, Manti's parents speak out for the first time. I couldn't figure out what was going on. Is it real? Is it fake? Is it someone's sick joke? Is there blackmail at the end of this? Many people are calling your son a liar. It hurts. That's And welcome back. The web of lies from Manti Teo's supposed girlfriend became increasingly intricate and implausible. I know you're involved in this phone relationship and you're trying to figure out Manti a way to get together uh, with Lene and in San Diego on your way home to Hawaii. But then you get a call from someone saying she'd been in a terrible accident. Who called and what was said? Her brother Noah uh, called and just said, bro, just letting you know that you know, Lene had just gone into a bad car accident. She was hit by a drunk driver. So then you traveled to San Diego? Yes. And L.A. on your way to Hawaii? Yes. Why in the world wouldn't you go visit this girl in the hospital 
this young woman who you claim is the love of your life. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you go see her? We actually planned to meet each other in San Diego, throughout my layover in San Diego, and this was before the accident happened. And so I get the phone call that she was just in the accident, and that was on April 28th. Two, two weeks later, I get to go home. And so I end up in San Diego, which was too far for me to go to the hospital. Then I fly to L.A., and the layover time was too short. But it's me. like a two-hour drive from, from San Diego, Manti. That just really doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me either at this point. So you regret not making an effort to go see this girl you say you're in love with at the hospital after she's in a very serious car accident? It was a conversation that I didn't want to have with my parents to say, uh, Mom and Dad, uh, I missed my flight. I'm not going to come on my flight because I'm going to go see Elena in the hospital. Don't you think they would have understood? Uh, I didn't test that. I, I didn't. You were told she was in a coma. Mm -hmm. And I know her family would supposedly put her cell phone to her ear mm -hmm. and you would talk to her. She would listen to your voice. Correct. She wouldn't speak, obviously. How would that work? They would put the phone supposedly right by her, her mask. And so all I could basically hear was her breathing. And every time I got on the phone, her breathing would quicken. And they kept saying that the nurses were wondering who was on the phone. Because every time that person would be on the phone, that's the only time she would respond in that way. What other sounds would you hear in the background? Uh, just a respirator. You know, just hearing the machines. And it's, yeah, it's, it was very real, Katie. It was very, very real. We received a lot of tweets and, and uh, emails from viewers preceding this interview. One person said, quote, insist he provides phone records of eight-hour calls to give himself credibility. Uh, we actually looked at your phone bill, and we did, in fact, see dozens of calls. Uh, a few lasted for hours, several hours. I understand you would fall asleep holding the phone, mm -hmm. I mean, or with the phone next to you, mm -hmm. connected to this individual, and then when you woke up, you would talk to this person. I hope you have rollover minutes, by the way. <laughs> mobile, mobile to mobile, mobile to mobile. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, uh, why would you do that? It's, it goes back to what my parents taught me. It's to always be there for somebody when they need help. She came out of her coma when she was on the phone with you. What did you hear on the other end of the line? Yeah, she was just breathing, and um, then she started to kind of whisper my name. I, I jumped for joy. I was like, see, I, I, they were right. I, I, I do help her. After she came out of the coma, she was diagnosed with leukemia. Correct. Well, either you're the most naive person on the planet, or this is the saddest story <laughs> I think ever written. I mean, at this point, did you think to yourself, Manti, what? Are you kidding? Now she has leukemia? I mean, it goes on and on and on. Yeah, I thought this that. This web of lies. And so you said, oh, no, now you have leukemia? Yeah, no. <laughs> I, th I thought that. You know, I thought this is, how could all this happen to one person? And I, I, had my, I had my doubts. But there was one day where I was at my, my friend's house, and his mom is a cancer survivor. And so I told her, hey, Nancy, uh, you know, my girlfriend just found out she has leukemia, and his mom, being the mom that she is, she said, hey, let me talk to her. And at the end, she gave me the phone back. She was like, you tell that girl if she needs anything. You tell her to call me. I know exactly what she's going through. I did this. I went through the same thing. And so I'm just like, okay. I was doubting that she has cancer. Now my auntie, who's a cancer survivor, knows exactly what she's going through. Well, when we come back, uh, you will hear the voice of Lene or whoever it was on the other end of the phone. That's right after this. And we're back with Notre Dame football star Manti Teo. You provided us with some voicemail messages. Let's, let's listen to one uh, that Lene left uh, on what she said was her first day of chemo. I am just letting you know you got here and I'm getting ready for my first session and I just want to call you, keep you posted. I miss you, I love you. Bye. 
Doesn't it sound like a girl? It Sounds does. Like a girl, doesn't it? Yeah. Here's an emotional one that she left accusing you. She was angry at you. Mm -hmm. She's accusing you of having someone else in your room. Let's listen to that. I don't know who had this phone. I don't care. This is my last century. You really play what you want. Was that an unusually emotional voicemail, or what had happened that upset her so much? She said that when she called one time, that a girl picked up the phone. And I told her, well, that's impossible, because I was in my room, and every time I sleep, I lock my door. Finally, we have a message from the day she said she was released from the hospital, which was September 11th, mm -hmm. 2012. Let's listen to that. Baby, I'm just calling to say goodnight. I love you. I know that you're probably doing homework or you're with the boys or grabbing me. What a fatty. But I just want to say I love you and good night. And I'll be okay tonight. I'll do my best. Um, yeah. So get your rest and I'll talk to you tomorrow. I love you so much. And see you You have no idea who the voice on the other end of the phone was for all those months. Mm -hmm. Do you think Renaya? could have been playing the role of Lene. Do you think that might have been a man on the other end of the phone? Well, it didn't sound like a man. It sounded, sounded like a woman. Uh, but if, if he somehow made that voice, that's, that's incredible. That's incredible talent to do that, especially every single day. On September 12th, you found out your grandmother, with whom you were very, very close, had died. Hours later, someone who claims to be Lene's brother calls you. Correct. This is the day after she was released from the hospital. Mm -hmm. What did he say? He was crying and kept screaming, and he just said, she's gone. And I said, who's, who's gone? Uh, it can't be Lene. Lene just got home. He said Lala's gone, which was their nickname for Lenny. Did you say, how could this happen? She seemed fine in the yeah. voicemail she left me the day before? They just said, you know, she started to breathe hard. She started to shake and started to sweat. And they took her, drove her in an ambulance. And at 1047 California time, she passed away, they said. Then on December 6th, Lenny suddenly reappears. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What were you told? So I answered the phone, and I thought it was your sister. So I started talking, and she said, I have to tell you something. She gave me a whole background of, you know, our family's connected with this, and, you know, we started doing this, and so... But she was saying she was being chased by drug dealers yeah, by or something? Drug dealers. But did she say, guess what, this is Lene? Yeah, and she just said, I was like, okay, so... Whoa, whoa, what, whoa, what's whoa, going whoa, back on? up. She says, hi, this is Lene? No, she said, first she said, it's me. And, and I played dumb. I was like, I know it's you. Her sister's name was Ui. I said, I know it's you, Ui. What? She's like, no, it's me. Man's eye, it's me. And I said, okay, Ui, stop joking around. I know it's you. She said, no, man's eye, it's Lene. When she said it's Lene, hello? Yeah. <laughs> what did you do? There was a long, silent pause. And, uh, yeah, I just... I was angry, just to say the least. But you knew something was up at that yes. point. Yes. Finally, you knew something was up. Yes. Two days after that, at the Heisman Trophy ceremony, you were interviewed, and you repeated the story that your girlfriend had, in fact, died of cancer. Mm -hmm. Let's listen. I mean, I don't like cancer at all. You know, cancer, I lost both my grandparents and my girlfriend had cancer. That's a lie. Why would you say that? At that time, I didn't know. Let's be honest with you. Like, I did not know. Come on, this person calls and says she's it's saying, Lene. And then she I says, I told you Leo. I had died. And yeah. I mean, you knew some. I mean, you kept telling. You stuck to the script. Mm -hmm. And you knew that something mm -hmm. was amiss, Manti. Correct. Why? Well, if 
anybody put yourself in my situation. Katie, put yourself in my situation. I, my whole world told me that she died on September 12th. Everybody knew that. This girl who I committed myself to died on September 12th. Now I get a phone call on December 6th saying that she's alive, and then I'm gonna be put on national TV two days later, and they ask me about the same question. You know, what would you do? I no. think on December 6th or 7th, I would have gone to my coaches or gone to someone and said, this situation is so messed up. Mm -hmm. I have been, I think, the victim of a cruel prank. This person is changing her story. They're messing with me. Mm -hmm. It's not holding up. This is not, this is not right. We got to get to the bottom of this now. That's what I would have done. Yeah, I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why I think, Manti, people are looking at this story and thinking that you helped perpetuate this story of hardship and pain, which I think was, as you said earlier, legitimate. Mm -hmm. But this story was working for you. You were being considered uh, for the Heisman Trophy. I mean, it was a huge, huge deal. Yeah. So did you say, I'm, this is my story and I'm sticking to it? Uh, was there a part of you saying that? Part of me was saying, if you say that she's alive, what would everybody think? Now, what are you going to tell everybody who follow you, who you've inspired? What, what are you going to say? And at that time, on December 8th, two days after I just found out she's alive, as a 21-year-old, I, I wasn't ready for that. I didn't even tell my parents yet. I didn't tell anybody. The only one who knew was me. That's all. And I felt that I could not, I did not know who to turn to. I did not know who to tell. I did not know who to trust. It was a big thing for me, and I was scared. That's the truth. I was just scared, and I didn't know what to do. Didn't a part of you just want to tell the truth? Yeah. And I eventually... I did to my parents. You did decide to tell your parents, mm -hmm. your mom on Christmas Day. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that right after this. We're talking today to Manti Teo, whose story has made national headlines. His parents, Brian and, and Otelia, are here as well. Before I, I talk to you all, I wanted to ask Manti about one photograph. This was the last photograph that you were sent, allegedly, of. Lene. And you asked her, uh, I guess on December 6th or shortly thereafter, if you are in fact who you say you are, if you're in fact alive, send me a photograph of yourself mm -hmm. holding a piece of paper that said what? That said, I had her initials, uh, MSMK, which stood for Melalenge Se Lala Marie cool. I had the date and had a sign so from my town this is our sign like you always see me taking pictures of this and just because I'm proud of where I come from and I how to do that same sign and so on December 21st 2012 I get that picture and that's where I really you know December 8th happened and you know I still I was like okay what's going on and then when this happened I was like okay she's alive now what do I do? And that's when I came home and told mom and dad. So you got home, and on Christmas Day, Manti tells you what? Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> he, I mean, it, was, it was a difficult conversation. I mean, it took him a while to finally say it. Um, and he told, he basically said, you know, Lene's alive. And it was complete, utter shock. The reason I say that is because this, you know, the belief in this person or the deception wasn't only with Manti, it was our entire family. We had conversations with this person. So in our mind, we had followed the same pattern as Manti. What do you think about Manti getting this shocking phone call on December 6th, and then continuing to talk about her 
as if this really happened? Well, when I look back, when I reflect on the, on the, on the night I found out, I, I, I couldn't figure out what was going on. I mean, so many th ideas are going through your head of what this possibly could be. I mean, is it real? Is it fake? Is it someone's sick joke? Is, this, is there blackmail at the end of this? And, you know, Manta is coming to the end of his career, and, and he's, is, is someone going to solicit him later on? And, and all these thoughts are going through my mind, and I, I kind of had to sit there for a good day or two just yeah. kind of figuring out and asking him, are you sure? Are you really sure? Now many people writing about this are calling your son a liar. They're saying he manipulated the truth, really for personal gain. It, it hurts. That's my child out there. That's my child that, in my eyes, always puts others before himself. He did exactly what I would expect a responsible, respectable young man to do to extend himself to someone who said that they lost their father and now they have cancer. I'm proud of his character. I mean, he, I mean, I'm just, it just hurts to see, you know, his picture and his, his name being displayed as someone that is dishonest. The hardest part of this whole experience is see my family go through it all because of something that I did. That's the hardest part for me. But I'm glad that my parents are here and I'm with them and that they're okay. Because, uh, like I said, joy in, uh, in any child's life is to, uh, to make your parents proud. The greatest pain is to know that they're experiencing pain because of you. And Brian, for you to see your son being accused of promoting this story, prolonging this story, and lying about this story. If they're saying that Manti lied about something, then, it, then he, they might as well say the rest of us lied about what we're talking about today. Because the, the story about this, as bizarre as it may seem, was, was reality for us. Yeah, in retrospect, Visions 2020, we can say, oh, the red flags all came up. But when you're in the moment, it's every day. I'm proud of this guy. I really am. And nothing that has happened in the last couple weeks is going to take that away. He's not a liar. He's a kid. He's a 21-year-old kid trying to be a man, and, uh, and I love him. I really do. Well, when we come back, what should happen to the young man who says he instigated this? We'll talk about that next. with Manti Teo and his parents, Brian and Otelia Teo. So have you had any contact with anyone related to this young man, Renaya? We did, you know, send a message to them through an intermediary because we didn't have any contact information of them, just expressing our heartfelt uh, prayers for them because I can only imagine what they're going through on that side. and. It really isn't anything as a parent you want to see your child go through. And I just want to be able to let them know that, we, that we're thinking about them and praying for them also. What would you say to this person you claim was responsible, Renaya? What would you say if you could meet him again face to face? I just say you hurt me. And you hurt me only because you involve my family. 
But after that, I'd say, hey, draw nearer to your family, because that's exactly what I did. You know, it's only in these times that you realize who is actually in your corner. You know, during these hard times, you actually, you see, you know, in the middle, from, from August to November, you had a lot of people cheering for you, a lot of people saying, you know, you do, you're so great, you're so great. And now when something like this happens, you, you see who's actually in your corner. You see who actually loves you. You see who actually has always been there. And it starts with these two sitting next to me. Kids, listen to mom and dad. <laughs> Finally, how do you think this is going to affect your professional future? That I don't know. And to be honest with you, as long as they're okay, Whatever happens, happens. You know, as far as my draft status, I hope and pray that good happens, obviously. But, you know, as long as my family is okay, I can live, live with whatever happens. Well, Manti, Brian, and Otelia Teo, thank you all so much for coming and talking with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you.